biblical. You know what? When you start the tape, good. That's the one thing I forgot to do. The recording is in progress. If you're watching the tape, you didn't miss anything. Um, and then December 20th, which is two weeks from tonight, Judea events Greece and Rome. Today was the eighth and last day of Hanukkah. So I'm going to talk about the conflict between the Jews and the Seleucids. And one of the big issues there is was that specifically anti Semitic? Is it a precursor of anti Semitism? Or is it just one rebellion among many in the ancient world. We'll talk about the struggles of the Jews against the, the Seleucids. We'll also talk about the struggles against the Jews in Alexandria, against the Ptolemies and the local population, and then the two wars that the Jews fought against the Rome, the Romans in in um, uh, 66, and then in one third, and then in uh, um, one one sixties. Uh, and then we'll talk about all of those periods and what was the anti-Jewish persecution, what were the causes why the Jews rebelled, and what is the what type of prejudice was there anti against the Jews that caused the caused the military um, ex, uh, explosions that occurred in those those periods. So that that will be the topic December twentieth. Then on we take a break, and then on January third. We're going to start talking about anti-Judaism, the origins of anti-Semitism in Christianity. So we'll spend the way the plan is here. We'll do one session on anti-Judaism in the Christian Bible, the history and the legacy, and the way that carries through um, in terms of the role of the Jews vis-a-vis -vis Jesus, the perceptions of the Pharisees, the, the um, Paul's opinion of the Jews and of Jewish law and how those reverberate later. So that'll be the topic for January 3rd. We take a bit, it's not every Monday night, so you gotta follow the schedule. You then have it until the 24th and we'll continue the story of Judaism and early Christianity. And part of this I covered in another course, but we're gonna focus here really on the nature of anti-Jewish prejudice. And this will talk about the anti-Jewish statements and sentiments in the church fathers. Uh, in the early writings of the church. So we're going here in the period of Constantine and when Christianity becomes the religion of the empire. And there a lot, of, a lot of scholars see a turn to more increased persecution against Jews and anti-Jewish sentiment when Christianity starts to veer away from Judaism. And we'll look and we'll read about them. We'll read some of those passages and take a uh, take a look at it and the, the role that those play in, in the history of Christian anti-Judaism. And then on the 31st of January, the Jewish minority in Islam. I don't want to forget about Jews in the Islamic world, because it's many scholars just tell the history of anti-Semitism as having its origins in Christianity. So this is one of the things that we're going to be focusing on in the class. Was there an anti-Semitism before Christianity in the biblical period? In the Greek and the Hellenistic period, in the Roman period, and also is there anti Jewish prejudice in the Islamic world? We know there is today, but are there, did that exist in, the, in medieval Islam? And what are the origins of anti Jewish prejudice that might be found in the Quran or the early Islamic texts? So we'll spend some time looking at that and kind of raising the question of the, the, the connections that might or might not exist between anti-Jewish and anti-Israeli prejudice, anti-Israel prejudice in the Muslim world and relate that to the heritage from medieval Islam. On February 7th, we're gonna go back to Christendom and the Jewish minority in the medieval, in, in, in medieval Europe and we'll talk general there, the, um, we'll talk about the role of the Jews, economic persecution, uh, the issue of the expulsions. And I'm going to do some focus on it specifically on the issue of the blood libel. We'll carry that through a few years. That's a particular story of, of, uh, that is important for a lot of historians in terms of um, it's a, the, the pivotal role. First of all, it's a tremendous example of what's often called irrational anti Semitism, where it is not based on any type of reality. The blood libel that Jews would murder a young Christian boy and use the blood to make matzah and Passover. It's fascinating anthropological aspects in terms of the Christian's view of Jewish views of Christianity and that the symbols would go back and forth there. And some scholars do point out that that 
when the blood libel and the lunch, when I talk about the folks like I do this, talk more specifically about it, when the blood libels become more common, that's when anti-Judaism starts to transition into anti-Semitism. I'll talk about what the difference is there, that anti-Judaism is a prejudice against the Jewish religion, whereas anti-Semitism is used in many different ways. One of the ways anti-Semitism is used as a prejudice against people of Jewish descent. Uh, which is not related to the religion. Now, obviously, the blood libel is a religious issue, but there's a prejudice there that goes beyond rational theology, if those terms are already not uh, contradictory. <laughs> so with that, we move to March 14th, when I want to really focus there on the Jew and medieval Christian art. as just a zeroing in on the way that Jews are depicted in Christian iconography and other expressions and seeing the prejudice there and the, the way the two is perceived. Um, and, and then we'll focus on, mention there the catastrophe in Spain. I may broaden that to more other examples of the, of the um, expulsions that take place, but I'm gonna show you a minute why I wanna spend some time focusing on that. The issue of the, of the conversos and the Muranos, the what drove the Inquisition. Some scholars see that story as the development of a racial, racial anti Semitism, right? That there are new Christians that came from Jewish blood. Are they really Christian? Is it, and then that's a racial issue, not a theological issue. On April 4th, we'll talk about says Luther on the Jews in early modern Europe. So we'll talk about the early modern period, Protestantism. We'll do a little more on the blood light of that. And Luther, who wants to convert the Jews and then becomes viciously anti-Semitic. Um, the term is still, although the term is still not used at his time, uh, in his hatred of the Jews for not converting. So we'll, we'll take a closer look at that. And on April 11th, anti-Semitism in the industrial age. This so sort of modern political anti-Semitism. If you read the article in the Jewish Standard on Friday, things like I gave a confession there in a sense that I was, I had always thought of anti-Semitism as really a late 19th century development as a reaction to the pressures of industrialization, of the changes, the economic changes and the pressures on the old system. And the Jews were identified with the causes of modernity, with, with, uh, with, with industrialization, with capital, with finance. The Jews were blamed for the struggles that people had. And, and, and then, so the anti-Semitism, which is a 19th century term, it's first used for the first time in Germany in, in the first time in Germany in 1879, sort of a modern development. And what well, doing in the, in, what we're going to explore in this course, and what I've been doing in my preparation for the course, is seeing that, is revisiting that, and then seeing that anti Semitism, while it takes that form in the modern period, it's not a modern phenomenon, that it has roots roots that go back uh, from for 2,000 years prior to that. So we'll talk about the development and the industrialization and how it takes on that political and that secular element when it moves away from the theological issues. And then on April 25th, we'll focus on the Holocaust and May 2nd on Zionism and Israel. And both of those, the legacy of the Holocaust and how that, um, ironically, the element the Holocaust, which is the worst thing that happened to the Jews in history, sort of drives a sort of philo Semitism to today and fuels all efforts to fight anti Semitism. And then you have Israel, which is one of the most wonderful things that happened to the Jews in millennia, does drive anti Semitism. So we'll talk about those legacies there and how they interplay with, with each other. Um, and then the final class will focus on anti Semitism in America, in our world, and how that specifically changed. So with that, I want to focus on these um, statistics here. Let me take this down so it's out of the way. There we go. Um, this is from the Pew study of American Jews in, that in, was done in 2020, just before the pandemic. And it's probably the most accurate survey description of the opinions and the demography of the American Jewish population. First is the Pew Research Center is the, is the, sets the standard on these surveys. 
but also because they did a survey seven years before that in, two, in, 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 in 2013. So they were able to, they had a benchmark that they were able to balance it against. And one of the things that they found when they compared 2020 to the 2013 results was the increase in concern for anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism in 2012, 2013 was at the very bottom of the list of what American Jews were concerned about. And seven years later, in 2020, it was way up at the top. And what this showed is that, uh, see, most Jews, so there's more anti-Semitism. The question was, do you think there's more anti-Semitism now than there was five years ago? 75% of American Jews said yes. That there's been an increase in anti-Semitism. So they're reflecting from 2020 back to 2015. And you'll see some of the brain down. The question is then why? And 5% said because more people hold anti-Semitic views, 35% because people with anti-Semitic views feel more free to express them, on 33% because of both. Um, on the minority, very small minority says about the same. So I say, but so that's the distinction there is important. The difference is the anti-Semitism new, or is it always been there? And then there are certain times in history where it comes to the surface and other times when it's held down. So these reflections of American Jews in 2020 reflect a whole broad spectrum of Jewish history that we'll be looking at. That do you have certain increases like anti-Semitism in the late 19th century that leads to the Nazis and the Holocaust? Is that a specific element to European in the, in the European industrial age? Or has there always been hatred of Jews? And there are certain times when it when it's it it, it it the effect is felt more than at other times. Because of those questions that were raised here by the study, because of the increase in the concern for anti-Semitism, because of the change that every every Jewish or institution in the United States has felt since the shooting in the Pittsburgh synagogue, right? Where where we synagogue has had to address how it deals with security, understanding a synagogue as a target that we never thought of things that way before in this country is why it's important for us to study anti-Semitism and to look at these questions. So the term anti-Semitism, as I said, was coined in 1879. And we, we know the year it was, it was coined, and we know the person it's associated with, his name is Bill Lamar, who lived from 1818 to 1904. He was a journalist. He actually recanted right but later in his late life, he, he, he regretted the role that he played, because he was a sort of left-wing anti-Semite with this such a thing. Uh, this is a quotation from his um, most famous work called Der Sieg des Judentums über das Germantum, The Victory of Judaism over Germanism. I picked this sentence from the text. Dear reader, it's, it's a track. While you are allowing the German to be skinned alive, I bow my head in admiration and amazement before this Semitic people which has us under heel. And then later, towards the end of the work, with the entire force of its armies, the proud Roman Empire did not achieve that which Semitism has achieved in the West, and particularly in Germany. It's Semitism that's used there, not anti-Semitism, but he's using Semitism as an idea, which is the influence of the Jewish influence against Germanism, Implicit in that is that Judaism is foreign to Germanism, right? And that's and that's why it must be separated out. Why is he used the term Semitism? So let's let's think about that. I want to show you one more passage. This is from the statutes of the organization that Wilhelm Mar founded called the Anti-Semit Liga, the Anti-Semitism League, which was a German political organization founded in 1879. And before the, up through the Holocaust, anti-Semitism was an acceptable, or quotes, political position. They had anti-Semitic parties that were outwardly anti-Semitic. To be an anti-Semite in a political sense in Europe meant that you opposed Jews having full citizenship rights because they're a foreign element. So, uh, and remember, Jer Jewish civil rights, we call emancipation, was only universal in Germany in 1871. So it, it's the context is 
1871, the Jews get full rights. 1879, an organization forms to, 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 to fight against that. You know, we see in our own days, they have Roe v. Wade 1973, it might be rescinded now, right? So there's within, and this is a shorter period. So it was a political issue whether the Jews should have civil rights and why did they oppose it? And I pulled this phrase from the, the statutes of the League. The purpose of the association, and this is the first time where the term anti Semitism is actually used, and Wilhelm Mars assumed to be the one who penned the statutes of the anti Semitic League. So it's the purpose of the association formed under the name anti Semit Liga. Now, I didn't translate it there because you're going to see why in a minute. There's a reason why I kept that in German, but League, Liga is League, right? Is to bring together non Jewish Germans towards the one aim of saving our German fatherland from complete Judaization and to make life tolerable there for the descendants of the original inhabitants. So you, you, the argument there is that Jews are not Germans, right? That the original inhabitants are the non-Jewish Germans. He says non-Jewish Germans, he doesn't say Christian. And that's why he uses the term anti-Semitism because anti-Semitism is a secular scientific term. It's not theological. So by, by taking the, by saying the prejudice against Jews is not theological, it, that's what makes it kosher in the 19, late 19th century anti-Semitic context for German politics, right? because it was a modern secular country. So this was a secular political issue. That's the transition that happens in anti-Jewish prejudice in the late 19th century. And that's, the context of the term anti-Semitism. Is that a question? Yeah. Yeah. Could you tell us how they thought that there was Judaization? Okay, the question was how they thought there was Judaization. So we're, we're going to spend out the whole class and talk about what the term Judaization is. The way I think, the best way to understand anti-Semitism is a, it's a reaction to perceived Judaization. It's a, it's an idea, you know, it, it's a response to something that is imagined. Obviously, Germany was not being Judaized. The way that they understood it is liberal policies, socialist policies, um, what today we might call globalization, right? Those, those, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the troubles of the local farmer, Right, because you can get, you can buy produce cheaper at the supermarket. The troubles of the local uh, uh, clothing uh, people make clothing because you can you can go to the Jewish owned department store, even if they weren't all owned by Jews. That it's because of the the right, the industrialization was assumed. So the economic changes and the political changes of liberalization were from a conceptual way were called Jewish because they was a change in the adjustment to modernity, to industrialization. And if you can call it Jewish, then by opposing Judaism, or opposing Jews, by being anti-Semitic, you're opposing the change in society. So that, that's what it means there. But we'll see that the same things line up. It just uses the same similar, different terms, but they line up that way in every period as we go through, um, through, this, this, through the course. Of history here. Can you give us a sense of what the population of Jews in percentage is like at that time? In Germany, a similar amount. I want to say one two percent. It's not yeah. Would it be negligible? No, but in Berlin it was greater. It depends. It's no. It's like it's like the same thing. I said, what's the percent of Jews in America? Well, it's a little less than one and a half percent, but not in Bergen County, not in. Brooklyn, you know, so it depends where it is. And so much of this also is perception, not reality. You know, so in, in the perception of the anti-Semites, the anti-Semites always perceive the Jews as being far more numerous than they are, you know, and far more influential than they are. And that's part of the idea of, of anti-Semitism. So by understanding this, this is where the term comes from. It brings me to this question here, and I want to focus on the question of spelling. So whenever I, I spell anti-Semitism the fourth way, lowercase one word, every time I try to write that in Microsoft Word, the spell check changes it to the top, to the middle one, with a lowercase and a capital S and a hyphen. 
Every time I write a column, an op-ed, and I send it to the Jewish Standard, the editors change it and put the hyphen in. So there's there's a different, and a lot of that every different publication has its standards applied. But there are there's a reason behind this. These are four different ways that you will find of spelling anti-Semitism. And most scholars prefer it to be one word. In German, it's one word, antisemitismus. There's no hyphen. The hyphen is, and in most languages, there's no hyphen. Antisemitism is the term in, in, in Hebrew. The hyphen appears in English. I want to read you from three different sections of responses to this issue of how to spell antisemitism. Uh, this first one, and I'm going to go through these books later. This is from a book I didn't put on the list. It's the American Jewish Committee published this uh, anti-Semitism in America Today. It's out of date because America Today is this wasn't today. Um, but it's a quotation from the historian um, Yehuda Bauer. The term anti-Semitism was coined in 1879. He mentions Wilhelm Mayer. Um, the term Jew hatred had become obsolete for it described traditional Christian antipathy toward Jews. It did not suit the modern pseudoscientific nationalist anti-Christian ideology, which arose during the second half of the 19th century. Right? The, the Nazis were not really Christian. You know, I mean, it was they allied with the Christian, but they were also anti-Christian. So the standard, okay, so he um, the standard bearers of the new or revised ideology saw the neutral sanitized term and not contain the word Jew. And that would sound as though it had come from the world of the new social sciences. Now it sounds scientific, Semitism. Mars neologism came from the field of comparative philology, which had labeled certain languages, particularly Hebrew, Arabic, and Aramaic as Semitic. And that's a separate language group than the Indo-European language group, which means that Jews are nowhere near Aryan. Aryan are the top of the Semitic group, the Jews are Semitic group. And there was, and there's a correlation between language groups and, and the science of races, right? Where, which is not a science today. Uh, I was gonna do dark quotes, but I'm holding the mic in the books as well. <laughs> right, the idea that peoples, but, but, but anthropologists still study this today, that through languages, you can trace the evolution of different groups of peoples. So um, obviously it doesn't work because the, you know, the, and the, the Arabs, you know, are not included under anti-Semitism. They are Semites. Uh, so this is a quotation from Yehuda Bauer, uh, and this is from the quotation I'm reading from is from 1994. Sometimes in English the word is written with a hyphen. However, this is an altogether absurd construction since there is no such thing as Semitism to which it might be opposed. Even though, of course, Wilhelm Marx did talk about Semitism, but. It's not a real thing. <laughs> um, in German and Hebrew, there's no hyphen. The word has no precise meaning, although its connotations are well understood. Um, so uh, despite the rather elliptical reference, Mars readers, his colleagues, and his disciples did not have to struggle with the meaning of anti-Semitism. They knew what he meant. So that's the issue on, on the spelling. There really is no such thing as Semitism. I want to read two more, um, two more recent poignant uh, this is from Peter Hayes. It's a wonderful book called Why Explaining. Sorry? Well, there's a hand up and there's a question in the chat. Do you want those now? Or okay, let me read the two yeah. passages and then we'll stop for the questions. Um, but remind me of my second one. So, um, Peter Hayes um, taught at Northwestern and was the chair of the academic committee that, that advises the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And in his book uh, called Why Explain the Holocaust, he addresses this question of the spelling of anti-Semitism. Um, and he says, until recently, English spelling has unwittingly accepted the anti-Semite's case. Since the customary insertion of a hyphen and a capital letter in anti-Semitism, which is the capital over here, right, the second option, and the hyphen, implies that there is something called Semitism somewhere. The original language of the term German doesn't make this mistake. There it's spelled antisemitismus without a hyphen. Nowadays, people and institutions have uh, allied to the subtle fact, you know, I've noticed that the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum um, insists on a one word spelling of antisemitism, but Microsoft Word and the Oxford English Dictionary have not gone on. Uh, and then, so there it is. And the last section I want to read. 
diabetes. The last quotation is from a book by Deborah Lipstadt called Anti-Semitism Here and Now. She's a professor at Emory. Um, Georgetown and actually was uh, uh, has a position with the Biden administration specifically on anti-Semitism, with thanks to Linda Schenker for getting this book for me. Um, and this is a, her description. She has a whole mini chapter on the spelling of anti-Semitism. And um, she, of course, also mentions Mar. And um, for him, the legions of people who adopted this word, it meant one thing and one thing only, hating members of the Jewish race. Um, now about the hyphen. For some reason, when the word first appeared in English in 1893, it was given a hyphen. In French and Spanish, it's always appeared without a hyphen and lowercase. And she uses it lowercase without the hyphen. Um, I chose, I chose, I choose not to go to the hyphen because of the word, both as its creator had intended and as it has been generally used for the past 150 years, means quite simply the hatred of Jews. It does not mean hostility toward a non-existent thing called Semitism. Wilhelm, when Marr coined the term, he was most definitely not referencing people who spoke Arabic, Aramaic, Amharic, Akkadian, or Ugaritic. That is why I find it particularly offensive when people who speak any of those languages claim that they cannot possibly hate Jews because the language they speak is linguistically linked to Hebrew. Which is an argument that has been made by said there. Finally, uh, she says, um, I make a sort of statement by going with a lowercase anti-Semite. In my small way, I am, she says, it's, it's, it's making a statement that it doesn't deserve a capital letter. It was given a capital letter in German because in German, all nouns are capitalized. But, I wanna, but then she tells this story that's a great story. It's, a, it's a, 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 a joke that was told by Jews in the Nazi Germany. And the story is this. Two Jews were sitting on one of the few park benches permitted to choose. One was reading the Berliner Gemeindeblatt, which is a Jewish communal newspaper. The other, the virulently anti-Semitic Nazi publication, Der Sturmer. Why on earth are you reading that thing? The Gemeindeblatt reader asked his friend. When I read a Jewish publication, his friend replied, I hear of our bows and terrible fate. When I read Der Sturmer, I read how we control the banks, world media, international governments, and how powerful we are. I must prefer the latter. <laughs> and then she writes, something this absurd does not deserve a capital letter. <laughs> so I took some time looking at those definitions, the issue on the spelling, because it underscores what Semitism means, what anti-Semitism means, that the term is really a reflection of what of what developed in the late 19th century, but we use it for such a so much broader issues. We don't use it that way even today when we talk about anti-Semitism. We're not using it in the same specific sense that the term is used, but yet there is a value to the term. And there are many scholars have worked hard over trying to figure out and coin a definition and governments and, and non-governmental organizations and works a working definition of anti-Semitism and alternative work definition of anti-Semitism. But the, the usefulness of the term is that there is a prejudice against Jews that is specific against Jews that is different and unique from other prejudices of other people. And the way it applies to anti-Israel statement is it, it, it's, it's to criticize Israel in the same way that one criticizes other countries doing similar things is not anti-Semitic. But to specifically criticize Israel, as a, especially as a Jewish state, and referencing its Jewishness, then that is anti-Semitic. We'll talk about that at the end of the class, but all of these are signifying use of the term. Okay, you said there were questions in the chat. I can't see, well, I can see the chat here, actually. Let me open it. Um, Mary, do you want to unmute yourself? Are the Germans against other foreigners at that time? So let me first, I'll just go through these. Um, we'll, we'll focus on those questions when we get to that period. Um, not the same way because the Jews were, and we'll see it in the other periods, that they were visible minorities in reality and also in the mentality of where they live, different from other foreign groups. There's a special role played by the Jews. The Arabs cannot exist in the Arab world because Arabs are Semites. Yes, that's a good point. 
and that's what Professor Lipstadt mentioned that I kind of went through quickly. It's it, that's an that's an absurd statement because <laughs> anti-Semitism doesn't mean what it literally means. It means and Vilma, and that's why if you read the passage from Wilhelm Marx, it's very clear. He's not talking about descendants of the Semitic language group. He's talking about Jews. He's talking about Jews in a country where he lives. So that's why it, 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 it and, it, and then it's just the words take on different meanings through time. Okay, you said Mary had a question? Mary, can you unmute yourself? All right, Mary, if you'll type, type your question in the chat, we can get yeah, it that way. Question, Mary, we'll get to it. So the rest of today, I want to go through a series of books uh, that to share. I'm, as I've been preparing, there's an endless library of books in multiple different disciplines. And I looked at some, I've completely ignored others. Some of them are suggestions to read. They'll give you a sense of the different stuff that we'll be talking about that I'm looking at for this class. First, what to read general works. This is a book that came out just a few months ago by Dara Horn called People Love Dead Jews, Reports from a Haunted Present. It's a collection from essay. She lives in Montclair. Um, I contacted her a few weeks ago. She just emailed me back last week because I asked her to be our speaker for a Holocaust service. I don't know if we're going to be able to arrange that for this year because she's uh, been speaking all over and her book was uh, uh, she was highlighted in, in, in a lot of the, in the New York Times and other, other places. Um, it's very evocative and she challenges a lot of the ways that we think about anti-Semitism and the role that anti-Semitism plays. Um, she talks about the effect of the shooting in the Pittsburgh synagogue uh, and what if that means for American Jews. Uh, and she has a long section on the story of Varian Fry, which is of particular interest to us in Ridgewood. If you lived in Ridgewood, in Ridgewood, New Jersey, as actually mentioned, where Varian Fry is from. Um, and the basic point that you can tell from the top is, it's, uh, is the sense that there's almost a, in she, the, this Jewish heritage tourism in places where Jews don't live anymore, that there's a darkness behind it. Because the, the fantasy of the anti Semites throughout history was a world without Jews. So, in a sense, being able to mark destroyed synagogues and places where Jews used to live and don't live anymore is a realization of that of that fantasy, which is very disturbing. And um, she has a section where she talks about the in China uh, that many, many Jews have lived and that not anymore. And, and um, the idea is it's, it's a frozen, Jews are frozen because it's a frozen image of the past that the whole city is frozen because it's it's, a, it's very cold there. <laughs> but her, her writing is, is wonderful and very powerful. So this is something that's hot off the press and, and is recommended as a general read that will hit some of the themes um, that we're doing. And then the other book that I had already mentioned is the book by Deborah Lipsch that anti-Semitism here and now. They said she is the scholar that the Biden administration has tapped to be their government's expert on anti-Semitism. Um, she also made a name for herself as she was had a long case of litigation over uh, I was someone that was a Holocaust denial a denier, and she was sued in and then won the case and was made fame doing that. So she's an important voice on anti Semitism. This book really focuses on anti Semitism, the discourse of anti Semitism and anti Israel discourse in college campuses. And the book is written as sort of a fictional dialogue between herself, a non Jewish colleague and a Jewish student. And the questions that they ask from both the non-Jewish colleague's perspective and the Jewish student's perspective and her response. And it goes through one of the issues that will really be towards the end of the class um, after she talks about anti-Semitism in general, it'll focus on Holocaust um, denial and on anti-Israel, uh, 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 the, the heated anti-Israel context on college campus. So that's Deborah Lipset's that book. Those books, it's also relatively recent, that's from 2019. Then David Nirenberg's books, this is, those books are light read as far as nonfiction history books on a, on a, on a heavy topic goes. 
That's publication. David Nirenberg's book is a heavy read. It's a heavy academic read. But a lot of the discussion of the class and the passages I'll be taking out of this book. David Nirenberg is the dean of the Divinity School the University of Chicago. And his book's called Anti-Judaism, the Western Tradition. His thesis in this book, which is in, which I found very in, influential, is saying that anti-Judaism has been an element throughout Western culture. He's focused on Western culture. He has a chapter in Islam, and that when we do that, we will base it on that. This argument is that throughout the whole history of anti-Semitism, anti-Jewish prejudice, it's not driven by reactions to real, actual Jews, but about more an imaginary idea, and that the prejudice is a reflection of other issues that are going on in Western Christian culture. And he goes through the different periods. It's a chronological order. It starts in the in the uh, Greco Roman, it starts in ancient Egypt, actually, when it starts the story, and he goes up to, 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 the, to, to, to modern times. So, if you want to do a heavy read, um, it's not as heavy if you only read the first half, which is leaving out the end notes. Second half is all the end notes. Uh, so, it should go a little bit faster. That I don't know because I read the end notes, so I can it should go faster. So that, that is this book, which is, if there was, if I'd say there's a textbook for this class, then it would be David Nirenberg's book. And if this were a real course, and you, then you would have to take, you would have to read it. But now it's optional. Finally, one thing that I found was interesting, and this was similar, if you remember some years ago when I, we did a course on the history of the land of Israel, and I found it frustrating that I couldn't find a good text on the history of the land of Israel, that the you found texts that follow the course of Jewish history or Israeli history, or you can found histories of you know Israel when it was under the Arab Arabs, you know, the Crusader period. But because different peoples occupy the territory, a history of the land is different than the history of the peoples that are in it because peoples keep changing. It's the same thing with anti-Semitism. I couldn't find a good history of anti-Semitism. We think it's obvious the history of the round, because throughout the different periods of Jewish history, the context keeps changing. So a totally different field, right? What does ancient Egyptian history have to do with the development of, 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 of the Nazism in early 20th century Germany? This book presented itself as doing that as a thick book, um, it's called it's by an Israeli professor, Robert Wistrich. The title is A Legal Obsession Anti Semitism from Antiquity to the Global Jihad. Okay, so, but the thing is that the first hundred pages deal with the history of anti Semitism, the first hundred or two hundred pages up until the Arab Israeli conflict, and then the remaining my pages, but the remaining thousand pages, 900 pages, all have to do with the last 50 years, and specifically with, uh, with an, an understanding anti-Israel sentiment as anti-Semitism. And again, it's not surprising that that should be stated by an Israeli professor. Uh, the, in America, we, we have an advantage of being able to see those distinctions or question if there is a distinction there. The argument is that the sentiment against Israel comes from the historical tradition of anti-Semitism, but it's also, I think, a good counterweight, literally, to uh, David Nirenberg's book, because David Nirenberg's book is focusing on anti-Semitism in the Christian story, in Christendom, and Wistrich is ending with the global jihad, and from that term you can figure out where he's going with it, so he's looking at how it develops and the role it plays in the contemporary Arab and Islamic world. So they, they're going in different directions. Um, and I haven't got my teeth into that book yet, so I, I'm not in a position of recommending it or not. At the beginning of David Nirenberg's book, he said, I'm not giving a history of anti-Semitism. I'm interested in the history of the idea of anti-Judaism in Western culture. If you want a history of anti-Semitism, see, for example, Robert Wistrich will be the obsession. That's how I found the book. <laughs> then I got excited about it. Then when I got the book, I'm like, ah, oh, this is not what I thought it would be. And that happens. So these are the general works. Now we're going to go 
got a little more specific. I'm starting to print too small. The first book, looking at Christian, the Christian from the Christian Bible to the Church Fathers to Martin Luther, all the, the development of anti Jewish prejudice. There are so many places to look for that. I mean, this is just one example by a um, scholar, Robert Chasen, who a, teaches Jewish history at NYU. He's written many books. He's easy to read because he's a clear, it's not an exciting read, but he's very clear. You know, and, and, and he, and this is a book, a uh, relatively recent book called From Anti Judaism to Anti Semitism. And he covers in each chapter the different periods of history and clearly lays out and understands the argument uh, and how the anti Judaism develops through, through, through Christian history. And when you read it, it really makes the point that, and this is one of the things that I was mentioned in the Jewish Standard discussion I had with Joanne Palmer. And one of the reasons why I resisted reading up Arn beyond what was required of me for my orals from my when I was in graduate school and teaching to teach about anti-Semitism, because it's not really a story about Jews. It's a story about non-Jews who didn't like Jews. It's their story, right? And if David Nuremberg is right that it's an aspect of Christian history and European history, then that's what it is. Right? It's not an aspect of Jewish history. I mean in some anti-Semitic Jews, but it's not a it's not a thing in among in Jewish culture. So you get that here from Robert Chasen. And then this book we read from when you did the course with me, if you did on, on Jewish, Jewish in, in, in Judaism and Christianity, James Carroll's an uh, ex-Catholic priest. Uh, this is he's a, if you haven't read Constantine's sword. The Church and the Jews, it's worth reading. It's already dated a bit, what's it from uh, 2001, um, but he tells the story of basically anti-Jewish prejudice uh, in the church, and then his grappling with that as a, as a believing Catholic. He's an ex-priest, but he still identifies as Catholic, and he, he takes Christian tradition to task unapologetically um, in this in this work, and it goes through the whole history as well. He's a wonderful writer. Then these are older works, more classic works. Marcel Simon is a French uh, author. I didn't put the date of this book, but it is, um, um, it's quoted here as 1996, but that's not true. 1986, 1964 is the original date. That's when it's from. Um, and it's really focusing on the period of the Church Fathers, 135 to 425. And the term Veris Israel, because Veris is, is Latin for true, the true Israel. So the argument of the church, and Robert Chasen talks about that in his book as well, although his book is thinner than this, is that it's the Christians are the true Israel. That's why they have the New Testament, that they are the heirs of the covenant, as opposed to the Jews who are the ones who are blind and cannot see, and kind of they were, they had. They had it's so like a relay race. They had the covenantal rod in the beginning and then it got passed along and they've been left in the metaphorical dark. So that's um, this book here. And he talks about, you can't talk about that without talking about the origins of what anti Semitism is. And he addresses the question of was there anti Semitism in the pagan period before Christianity? Got 10 minutes, yeah. What was it before Christianity? And then how does it develop in the church? This is from 1934, James Park's book, The Conflict of the Church and the Synagogue. He's a Christian scholar who's writing this just as the Nazis are coming to power. It's similar to what James Park's, similar to what James Carroll says. It's interesting that they're both named James. I hadn't thought about that, that before. The subtitle is The Study in the Origin of Anti-Semitism. He's looking at, again, it's a classic text, but following the church fathers, taking them to task for their anti-Judaism anti and trying to trace it. Rosemary Ruth, her faith and fratricide, the theological roots of anti-Semitism. This is a Protestant theolog theologian, American theologian, who is also takes the Christian tradition to task. This is sort of a tradition, especially post-Holocaust, for Christian scholars to say, where did Christianity go wrong? That the Holocaust could have happened, and how can we recover the original Christianity of, of Jesus and separate that from the anti Jewish, anti Semitic wrong directions that their religion took 
through the later periods of its history. So she, part of this book is an historical account, the other part is a, um, uh, is, is a theological uh, argument that she calls it, um, a theological critique of the Christian anti judaic myth. So it's, it's, there are many attempts, this is, um, what James Carroll does in a literary way, she does here in a straightforward theological way, and this is from 1995. Moving along, specifically on the Christian Jewish art, anti-Jewish art, there are many things to read. The, the book that I'm reading through that is a wonderfully evocative book is by uh, Sarah Lipton, who is spouse, she teaches at SUNY Stony Brook. It's called Dark Mirror, The Medieval Origins of Anti-Jewish Iconography. It talks about the first depictions of Jews in Christian European art, uh, the way Jews are represented in the stained glass in the Shark Cathedral, um, in illuminated manuscripts, where the development we see of the Jewish nose, of the beard, of the hat, and what, what the Jew not seeing, being blind, um, and what those mean. The other book is a book that specifically focuses on the the it's called the synagogue and the ecclesia, the synagogue and the church. That is a motif we see on a lot of Gothic cathedrals, where the, there's two women that are the personifications. And the, just lost the mic there. All right, I'll try to speak as loud as I can. They are uh, personifications where one, well, let me just see if I can go like this. Sometimes you take it out, you take it in and then. Okay. The church is tall, wearing a crown. The synagogue is blindfolded uh, with a broken staff. And we see this in a lot of cathedrals around. And this is a, a book that studies that, that I'm uh, grateful for the opportunity to get to read and delve into a bit more. Now, on the blood libel. So I have always been interested in the blood libel. The myth of ritual murder, Jews and magic and Reformation, Reformation Germany. So, um, is this is still an excellent book, and then this and by and then in, more in the 19th century, the butcher's tale, murder and anti-Semitism in a German town. These are thin books that are easy reads, not as easy read, not as thick of a book, but a brand new book from 2020 by an dictator called Blood Libel on the Trail of an Anti-Semitic Myth. I read this book. Uh, so a little disappointed by it because it, it is a very, very detailed on some of the most famous blood libel stories, but then because of the detail, she can't possibly cover everything. And in some cases, like it's lost in the detail of it and, and is less fulfilling on the sort of interpretive understanding of what's happening. Uh, and she, her expertise is on in, in the Polish, Polish Jewish history and focuses a lot on what happens there after the very famous case of the Trent blood libel in the beginning of the, um, of the early modern period. Finally, it led me to another book, Charvez, it was more anthropological angle, Blood and Belief, the Circulation of the Symbol Between Jews and Christians. Uh, so this book starts with the role of blood in the book of Leviticus, talks a lot about the blood libel, ends up with Nazism and then Zionism and this idea of Jewish blood. David Beal teaches at uh, University of California in Davis, so uh, it's exploratory. Don't worry about but the mic. I'm not going to worry about the mic. Okay, finally, the medieval and the modern. So this is why I wanted to make an interesting recommendation. This book, this thin book, is also came out this year by the American Jewish novelist, Joshua Cohen, called The Netanyahu, an account of a minor and ultimately even negligible episode in the history of a very famous family. Bibi Netanyahu plays like a 10 year old, eight year old boy in this novel, but it's about his father, Ben Sion Netanyahu, who is a scholar of the Spanish Inquisition. In fact, this is his book. 
<laughs> I recommend reading this one, not this one, uh, but it's the history, it's called The Origins of the Inquisition in 15th Century Spain by B. Netanyahu. B is for Ben Sion, not for Ben Yamin. It's the prime minister's father, his late father, who lived to like 100 years old. He died just a couple of years ago. The reason why it's important in the novelist, it's a historical novel, is because Ben Sion Netanyahu's argument is that what, what most scholars understand is the Inquisition is figuring out which of the new Christians were not really authentically Christian, and it's an Inquisition into the genuine and the sincerity of religious faith. He says it has nothing to do with about that. It's about racism, right? It's about Jewish blood, and he sees the Inquisition as the beginning of that, of that, that, that there's no way to accept Jews. It doesn't, it's not about religion. It's about ethnicity, it's about, and it's about racism. It's what later becomes modern anti-Semitism. And what Joshua Cohen did is he translates it into revisionist Zionism, which the Netanyahu's fell a part of that and connects that to the scholarship that Ben Sion Netanyahu wrote about the Inquisition. So it's, you can get the basic idea of the big book throughout this very interesting uh, and fun novel that was a very well acclaimed novel. In the general press, it got raving reviews. In the Jewish book review, it got it was it was uh, got a terrible review. So there was a tension between there, and that has to do with its presentation of Israel and Zionism. So for that reason, it's I highly recommend this book, Joshua Joshua Cohen's book. What else can we say about the blood libel? Gavin Langmuir is a, was a professor at Stanford. Uh, this book toward a definition of anti-Semitism is a collection of essays. History, religion, and anti-Semitism is sort of a, state, a synthetic statement of his argument. He, he focuses on the blood libels and that period in the high Middle Ages into the early modern period as the pivotal point when anti-Judaism becomes anti-Semitism, right? When is it no longer a theological dispute and is just a non-rational prejudice? based upon things that have no basis on reality or even something that you could legitimately disagree on. Um, and that's, and that's, and the, it's all of the discussions of the blood libel refer back to his pioneering work on that. So these are older books. They're published in 1990. The essays go back to the, most of them are from the 1970s. Okay, and I'm running out of books, but not really. There's more at home. It's just what I decided to share with you here. Going to the modern period, and this is, we've now made a full circle from the start of the evening when I talked about how anti-Semitism leaves the theology behind and becomes a political movement in, in Europe. So the book that I'm gonna recommend is by the German professor Goetz Alle. It's called Europe Against the Jews, 1880 to 1945, just came out in 2020. I've read most of the other books by this professor and I, I like what he writes. It's very solid, very balanced. And this is basically a survey from the beginnings of anti-Semitism, because right, 1879, 1880 is when it's coined up through, through the history of, of the Holocaust. So this is sort of a straight text, a history text on that. The other book that I highly recommend is what I read from briefly at the beginning of the class, Peter Hayes' book, The American Historian, Why Explaining the Holocaust. He gives the background of what leads up to the Holocaust among a lot of other issues in Holocaust history. These are some older texts that I have here. Um, Peter Pulser, this is from 1988, but sort of a standard uh, read on the rise of political anti-Semitism in Germany and Austria. So if you want to know more about Wilhelm Marr, although there's actually a whole book about Wilhelm Marr, but in the context, you can read that here. Jacob Katz, a very famous uh, Israeli scholar. This is his book on anti-Semitism from prejudice to destruction. He starts in 1700 because he tells the story of starting with the beginning of Jewish enlightenment, a response to Jews leaving the ghetto and up until 1933, which is when the Nazis come to power. This is Rehearsal for Destruction, a study of political anti-Semitism in Imperial Germany. It's published in 1949 by the American Jewish committee as a part of a series of called the Studies in Prejudice series, but also talks about the political developments uh, in pre-Nazi Germany. So for next week, whoops, for next week, that's my, that's enough books. 
I'll probably pick up some more. We'll mention it as we go through. There are so many other areas. You could have talked about the psychology of anti-Semitism. Could have talked, there's other aspects of the story we could have focused on. I wanted to give you that just quick bibliographical look to give a sense that there is so, there's so much to look at here. And is it possible to look at all these different areas and follow it as one story and follow one arc? So the only way to do that is to start at the beginning. Pharaoh, right, who wants to commit genocide. Right? He says, according to his exodus, to throw all the male Hebrews in the Nile. Haman, who, yes, wants to kill all the Jews in Persia. So we're going to look at those. So when we say, and everything, every way we think about anti-Semitism is driven by the Nazis and the Holocaust. And the big question is that specific to the story that I just talked about, like 1880s to the 1930s and 40s, or is it a much longer story? Well, here we have two examples from the Bible of non-Jewish leaders who allegedly sought to commit, sought to commit the genocide. So what does that memory mean? What is the reality behind it? Uh, and then if you want to give it a shot, it's after the introduction, but the first chapter in David Nirenberg's book, um, the title of that chapter is The Ancient World, Egypt, Exodus, Empire. So we're going to focus then on Egypt and not just on the biblical accounts, but also what we know from extra biblical sources about anti-Jewish prejudice in ancient Egypt. So there's some very interesting things there and see what the antecedents are. Is there a specific prejudice against Jews before Christianity? You know, we'll, the following week we'll do the Greek and Roman period, but we're gonna start in the more ancient stuff and the, and the Bible. Any last questions before we close? Yeah, go ahead, Dave. Yeah. Or somebody else. Okay, let's let me take the question here and then I'll go to the I'll go to the Zoom. I'm gonna close the uh and I got a bunch of chats there. Okay, David, go ahead. Okay, you mentioned that uh you saw uh, anti-Semitism, you were kind of alluding you thought it was like a rough right wing thing. But when I think of it, you know, with uh Ilan Omar, Rashida Talib, Al Sharpton, well it, you know, like that that's what makes the news over here. And it definitely right. Pretty much. So we are going to spend, I, I do want to talk about anti Semitism in America, so I save that for the end. <laughs> okay. So, yes, we hear it, and is it getting worse? That's why we said, right? The survey did show that our perception is that it is getting worse over the last five years in the halls of Congress or everywhere else. So, why is that? And and how disturbing is it? So I, I, I don't want to ignore that. But that's why I figured, you know, put it on the table, the parking lot, we'll get to there in the end. Um, okay, let me take this. Uh, I, I'm trying to find questions, but a lot of it is comments about audio. Yeah, the, only, <laughs> the, only, the only thing I see is uh, Eric Weiss is asking if you have a, a list of the books that you can share. Do I have a list? Well, the lists are in those. those I'll figure out a way to send the... I can email the PowerPoint or I'll take it down, but I don't know how, I don't have an email list for everyone here. So I don't know how to do that. Um, we'll think about it. We'll figure out how to do it. Uh, maybe we'll put it on the website of the synagogue and then you can find it there. So I'll, that's probably the easiest way to do that. Um, okay. And then uh, feedback, yes. Okay, a take off about a QAnon movement. Right, the QAnon movement that Bob Dworkin says is a take off on the blood libel, exactly, because it's non-rational. It's not based on, on facts or even supposed facts, <laughs> except to put that way. So, but whether there is a distinction there, see, that's a distinction that the Stanford historian Gavin uh, Lundmer makes, that there's a, he makes a trend that there's, there's uh, the transition from there's rational dispute, there's non-rational disagreement, and then there's irrational disagreement. Not everyone agrees there's a difference between non-rational and irrational, but we'll talk about that when we get there. But yeah. I'm, of course, as a psychoanalyst, I'm very interested in the idea that the blood libel was a projection, because in the Catholic religion, you're supposed to be drinking the blood of Christ and eating the wafer. And then somehow it got turned into the, the Jews making matzah from the blood. Right. It's, a, it's, it's obviously a projection, because, and the reason why it's, it's a total, and it's an irrational projection, because it's not based on any actual Jewish, I mean, there's no way to prove that no Jew did that, but there's absolutely no evidence that Jews did. 
And even at the time that every flood libel happens, there's there's always the arguments are always but there's no evidence for this at all. All of the circumstantial evidence points the opposite way. I mean, the big thing with the blood libel is that it's a it's a cardinal sin in Judaism to consume blood. So there, there, the idea that Jews would cook matzah with blood is is makes no sense. You know? uh, but we get the LS. So it's it, it's much more a a reflection on and what. Langmuir argues, and some other historians do, we'll get more into detail when we get there, is that this is the time where the church is sort of making the argument for transubstantiation and that the Eucharist is the blood in the body. So, uh, so then if there's Christians that are doubting that, then, the, then you project the, the, the doubt on, on a crime of the other. So there's, it gets very, very interesting. And we'll, we'll follow that as we get there. Thanks for coming tonight. Thanks for tuning here. And uh, same time, same station next week. And we'll fix the other glitches, whatever they are. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, that's it. Well, now everybody, I got to leave. <laughs> Thank you, Rabbi. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Much better without the mic. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Boy, there's so many aspects to anti-Semitism. <laughs> so much it was, to learn. It was better without the mic on the Zoom? Yes, yes, yes. yes. It's better it's without, without the mic. Zoom. Without the mic in the room? Yeah. All right, yeah. then we'll do without the mic next time. Okay. But but if you could repeat the questions that from the um, live audience, because we can't always hear the question. If you could repeat the questions. A little too far. A little too far. Next time. Next time. Okay, we'll figure it out. Or maybe they can come forward to where the mic is. Okay, we'll Lila Tov, Lila Tov. Lila Tov, good night. Good night.